The 1st of October, 1946, Nuremberg, Germany. After more than 10 months on trial, 21 defendants, who are among the most important political, military, and economic leaders of Nazi Germany, hear their sentences read. These high-ranking representatives of the criminal Nazi regime have to finally take responsibility for their crimes and answer before an international military tribunal who would punish them for unspeakable atrocities committed during the Second World War. It is only the first of many war crime trials held after the Second World War and would become a warning to war criminals and dictators everywhere. Once the true extent of the German atrocities, especially against Jews, are revealed, 12 defendants out of the 21 are sentenced to death by hanging. One of them is a former Chancellor of Austria and Reich Commissar of the Netherlands, Arthur Seizinquart. Arthur Seizinquart was born on the 22nd of July, 1892, in the Czech village of Stonazov, then part of Austria-Hungary, as the youngest of six children. His father, a school principal, was Czech, and his mother was German. In 1907, the family moved to Vienna, where Arthur studied law at the University of Vienna. The First World War began on the 28th of July, 1914. Seizinquart enlisted with the Austrian army and served in Russia, Romania, and Italy. He was decorated for bravery on a number of occasions, and while recovering from wounds in 1917, he completed his final examinations for his degree. In 1916, he got married to Gertrude Maschka. The marriage produced three children. In 1921, Seizinquart set up his own practice in Vienna and became a successful lawyer. Afterward, in January 1933, Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany, and he fully intended to bring about an Austro-German Union. However, Germany was not immediately militarily and diplomatically ready to carry out Hitler's foreign policy goals. First, Hitler and other Nazi leaders focused on establishing a Nazi dictatorship. However, behind the scenes, the Nazi leadership began planning territorial expansion and a European war almost as soon as they took power. Beginning in May 1933, the Austrian Nazis waged a propaganda and terror campaign, which was encouraged and funded by Germany. The Nazi goal was to undermine the regime of the Austrian Chancellor, Engelbert Dollfuss, by making him look incompetent. They staged disruptive protests and brawled with political opponents and the police. Austrian Nazis set off explosive and tear gas bombs in public places and Jewish-owned businesses. In June 1933, in response to a fatal Nazi bombing, the Dollfuss regime banned the Austrian Nazi party and its affiliates. Although the Nazi movement became illegal in Austria, the Austrian Nazis continued to operate illegally within the country. In mid-July 1934, Dollfuss had a discussion with Seizinquart regarding the calming of the very radical situation. Soon after, on the 25th of July, when Austrian Nazis attempted to overthrow the Austrian government, the conspirators shot and killed Chancellor Dollfuss. However, the majority of Austrians remained loyal to the government, and the Austrian military and police forces quickly defeated the conspirators. In the aftermath of the failed coup, Austro-German relations were a source of international concern. This was particularly true for Italy's Mussolini, who initially treated Austria as a buffer between Italy and Nazi Germany. But fascist Italy and Nazi Germany began to draw closer together in 1935 to 1936, and Mussolini began to pressure Kurt Schuschnigg, Dolphus' successor, to cooperate with the Germans. In 1937, Seizinquart was appointed Austrian State Councillor and was responsible for mediating the relations between the Schuschnigg government and the members of the National Socialist Opposition, who were acting only on Hitler's orders. Around this time, Seizinquart realized which way the political wind was blowing and became a respectable frontman for the Austrian National Socialists. On the 12th of February, 1938, Austrian Chancellor Schuschnigg traveled to meet with Hitler. He expected to discuss the tensions between Austria and Germany, but Hitler was ready to take full control of Austria and made a series of demands that included the following. Austria's foreign and military policies were to be coordinated with Germany's. Artur Seizinquart was to be placed in charge of policing and security matters. Austrian Nazis who had been imprisoned by the Austrian government were to be amnestied. Schuschnigg gave in, signed the agreement, and the same month appointed Seizinquart Austrian Minister of the Interior. On the 9th of March, 1938, Kurt Schuschnigg announced that there would be a referendum on a possible union with Germany versus maintaining Austria's sovereignty to be held on the 13th of March. After Hitler threatened an invasion and ordered Wilhelm Keitel to conduct military maneuvers near the Austrian border to make it appear an invasion was imminent, 
Chancellor Shushnik resigned his office on the 11th of March, and Sai's Inquart was appointed his successor. Austrian Nazis took over the country without firing a single shot. On the 12th of March, German troops crossed the border. They were not met with armed resistance, but with cheers and flowers. Terrified Jews, leftists, and Shushnik supporters tried to flee Austria. They raced towards the country's borders, hoping to reach them before they were closed. Some managed to escape, but most were trapped in a rapidly Nazifying Austria. On the 13th of March, Austrian Nazi Chancellor Seiz Inquart signed the law called the Reunification of Austria with Germany. This law, sometimes called the Anschluss Law, formally incorporated Austria into Nazi Germany and gave the Anschluss the air of legality. Austrians welcomed Hitler warmly as he traveled first to Linz and then to Vienna. Thousands turned out to greet the Führer, and on the 15th of March, when Hitler spoke to a huge crowd in Vienna's Heldenplatz, a large square in the center of Vienna, Seiz Inquart gave a short speech. Footage and photographs of the crowds appeared in German newsreels and newspapers. Their goal was to demonstrate the Austrian enthusiasm for the Anschluss and thus justify the illegal takeover of another country. When Hitler returned home to Berlin, he was greeted as a hero. The April 10 plebiscite was another propaganda opportunity. The result of the referendum seemed to indicate that around 99% of the Austrian people wanted to unite with Nazi Germany. However, between 300 to 400,000 Austrian citizens, such as Austrian Jews, Roma, and the Nazis' political opponents, were forbidden to vote in the referendum. For Austria's approximately 200,000 Jews, the Anschluss marked a terrible turning point. Beginning on the night of the 11th of March, and in the weeks that followed, there was pogrom-like violence across the country. Austrian Nazis and others beat up, attacked, and humiliated the Jews. They forced Jews to scrub the streets, clean public toilets, and perform humiliating exercises. Many decided to try to leave Austria. Lines appeared at the consulates across the city of Vienna. Austria was no longer an independent country and became a province of Nazi Germany, referred to by a new name, the Ostmark. Seiz Inquart became its governor, thus becoming Hitler's personal representative in Austria. As Reich governor in Austria, Seiz Inquart ordered the confiscation of Jewish property and sent Jews and political opponents to concentration camps. He also received an honorary SS rank of Gruppenführer, and, and in May 1939, he was made a Reich's minister without portfolio in Hitler's cabinet. The Second World War began on the 1st of September 1939. Germany launched the attack with an advance force consisting of more than 2,000 tanks, supported by nearly 900 bombers and over 400 fighter planes. In all, Germany deployed 60 divisions and nearly 1.5 million men in the invasion. Poland found itself fighting a two-front war when the Soviet Union invaded Poland from the east on the 17th of September, sealing Poland's fate. The last operational Polish unit surrendered on the 6th of October. After Poland's defeat in early October 1939, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union divided the country in accordance with a secret protocol to the German-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact. The German occupation of Poland was exceptionally brutal. Ethnic cleansing was to be conducted systematically against the Polish people. In the first three months of war, from the fall of 1939 until the spring of 1940, some 60,000 former government officials, military officers in reserve, landowners, clergy, and members of the Polish intelligentsia, such as scientists, teachers, lawyers, and doctors, were executed region by region in the so-called intelligentsia action, including over 1,000 prisoners of war. 
On the 26th of October, 1939, the Nazis established the general government, which was a German zone of occupation, established after the invasion of Poland. The chief administrator was Governor General Hans Frank, a lawyer and longtime follower of Hitler. Frank's deputy became Artur Seizinkwart. As deputy governor general of the general government of Poland, Seizinkwart was a supporter of the harsh occupation policies which were put into effect. In November 1939, while on an inspection tour through the general government, Seizinkwart stated that Poland was to be so administered as to exploit its economic resources for the benefit of Germany. Seizinkwart, an unwavering anti-Semite, also advocated the persecution of Jews and was informed of the beginning of the AB action, which involved the murder of many Polish intellectuals. On the 10th of May, 1940, Germany invaded the Netherlands. Soon after, a civil administration was installed under SS auspices and Artur Seizinkwart was appointed Reich Commissar of the Netherlands. He presided over the German administration that included many Austrian-born Nazis, who in turn supervised the Dutch civil service. This arrangement was to prove fateful for the Jews of the Netherlands. One of Zeiss Inquart's first steps as Reich Commissar of the Netherlands was to put into effect a series of laws posing economic discriminations against the Jews. During 1940, the German occupation authorities banned Jews from the civil service and required Jews to register the assets of their business enterprises. According to new laws, Jews were no longer allowed to run their own businesses. In January 1941, the German authorities required all Jews to register themselves as Jews. A total of 159,806 persons were registered, including 19,561 persons born of mixed marriages. The total number included some 25,000 Jewish refugees from the German Reich. A Jewish council was established in February 1941. On the 22nd and 23rd of February, 1941, German forces raided the Jewish quarter in Amsterdam, arresting and deporting more than 400 Jewish men to Buchenwald and Mauthausen concentration camp. The Dutch people's reaction was unique among the Nazi-occupied Europe. They organized the February strike, a two-day general strike, which started on the 25th of February, 1941. German officials brutally suppressed the strike. The action was followed by a hardening in Nazi policy. The German authorities and their Dutch collaborators segregated Jews from the general Dutch population and incarcerated 15,000 Jews in German-administered forced labor camps. The Germans then ordered the concentration of Jews in Amsterdam and sent foreign and stateless Jews to the Westerbork transit camp in the northeast part of the country. Some of the remaining provincial Jews were sent to the Fucht camp. Regulations which forced Jews to wear a yellow Star of David on their clothing as a means of identification were announced in the Netherlands on the 29th of April, 1942. Those caught without a badge after the 5th of May, when they came into effect, were arrested and detained for a six-week period. Deportations of Jews from the Netherlands began in July 1942. The last train left Westerbork for Auschwitz on the 3rd of September, 1944. During these two years, the Germans and their Dutch collaborators deported some 107,000 Jews, mostly to Auschwitz and Sobibor, where they were murdered. Only 5,200 survived. In addition, 25 to 30,000 Jews went into hiding, assisted by the Dutch underground, and two-thirds of those managed to survive. The geography of the Netherlands made escape difficult. The ruthless efficiency of the German administration under Artur Seizinkwart and the willing cooperation of the Dutch administrators and policemen doomed the Jews of the Netherlands. Less than 25% of the Dutch Jewry survived the Holocaust. One of the biggest impacts on the Dutch people during the occupation was caused by the German Arbeitseinsatz, or labor deployment, which forced every man aged between 18 and 45 to work in German factories. As part of this program, approximately 500,000 Dutchmen were transported by force to Germany. Life in the factories was hard and dangerous too, as the buildings were regularly bombed by the Allies. Those that refused to go were forced into hiding. Because some Dutch citizens couldn't bear to see what was happening to their country and people and resisted the occupation, they joined the resistance. This resistance's counterintelligence, domestic sabotage, and communications networks helped to provide key support to the Allied forces throughout the liberation of Holland. Members of the resistance, if discovered, were immediately sentenced to death. As Reich's commissar for the occupied Netherlands, Seizinkwart was ruthless in applying terrorism to suppress all opposition to the German occupation. 
a program which he described as annihilating his opponents. Arthur Seiss Inquart was Reich Commissar of the Netherlands during the whole occupation from May 1940 until May 1945, and in this position, he was responsible for sending slave laborers to Germany, the deportation of over 100,000 Dutch Jews to death camps, the suppression of the February strike, and the shooting of resistance fighters. In late 1944, when it became obvious that the Allies were about to retake the country, Hitler issued orders to enact a scorched earth policy upon the Netherlands. However, Arthur Seiss Inquart was able to greatly limit the scope to which the order was executed. Before Adolf Hitler committed suicide on the 30th of April 1945, in his last will and testament, he named the new government, headed by Karl Dönitz, and appointed Seiss Inquart as new foreign minister, replacing Joachim von Ribbentrop. However, Seiss Inquart held the office only from the 30th of April until the 2nd of May 1945. In the end, Justice finally caught up with Seiss Inquart when he was arrested by members of the Canadian Armed Forces on the 8th of May 1945 and tried at the Nuremberg Trials, which were held against representatives of the defeated Nazi Germany. He faced four charges, conspiracy to commit crimes against peace, crimes of aggression, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. During the trials, in relation to the 107,000 Dutch Jews deported to the Nazi death camps, Seiss Inquart said that he had had serious humane and legal scruples against the evacuation of the Jews, and even though he admitted, knowing that they were going to Auschwitz, he claimed that he had heard from the people who had been to Auschwitz that the Jews were comparatively well off there, and that he thought that they were going to be held there for resettlement after the war. However, his lies did not help him escape justice. On the 1st of October 1946, the International Military Tribunal found Arthur Seiss Inquart guilty of crimes of aggression, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, and sentenced him to death by hanging. In his final statement, Seiss Inquart spoke of the German occupation of the Netherlands, saying, My conscience is untroubled to the extent that the biological condition of the Dutch people during the period of my full responsibility, that is, up to the middle of 1944, was better than in the First World War, when it was neither occupied nor blockaded. In regards to Adolf Hitler, Seiss Inquart said, To me, he remains the man who made Greater Germany a fact in German history. I serve this man, and now I cannot today cry crucify him, since yesterday I cried Hosanna. Seiss Inquart was executed by American Army Sergeant John C. Woods, who had no documented pre-war experience as a hangman. It is believed that he was deliberately bad at his job to make the ten Nazi war criminals that he executed that day suffer, as they all died a long, agonizing death. The Nazis, executed by Sergeant Woods, fell from the gallows with a drop insufficient to snap their necks, resulting in their death by strangulation, that in some cases lasted several minutes. Additionally, the trap door was too small, causing several of the condemned to suffer bleeding head injuries as they fell. On the 16th of October, 1946, the day of his execution, Arthur Seiss Inquart was the last of the Nuremberg defendants to mount the scaffold. After he had said his last words, I hope that this execution is the last act of the tragedy of the Second World War, and that the lesson taken from this world war will be that peace and understanding should exist between peoples. I believe in Germany. Seiss Inquart was hanged. But because he fell from the gallows with insufficient force to snap his neck, his horrible convulsing lasted 14 long minutes before he died. He was 54 years old. After that, his corpse was cremated and scattered in the River Isar. There were no tears shed for Artur Seizinquart. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Please help us to create more videos by clicking on the donation link. Thank you and see you next time on the channel.